In this series, we are sharing a book published in October 2023, titled Clear Thinking. Turning Ordinary Moments into Extraordinary Results. The author of this book is Shane Parrish, whom you might have heard of. He is an entrepreneur, investor, and perhaps can be called a purveyor of insights. Parrish not only frequently writes for mainstream media but also maintains a blog and hosts a popular podcast called The Knowledge Project. He often engages in conversations with figures like Charlie Munger and Daniel Kahneman, showing a deep understanding of contemporary trends. Clear thinking is similar to other books we've discussed before, such as Hitendra Wadwa's Inner Mastery, Outer Impact, Eric Jorgensen's The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, and Stephen Covey's classic, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. These books all focus on the self-cultivation of modern individuals. Excelling in today's world requires advanced knowledge, high-level initiative, and superior ethics. People like Parrish are products of the spirit of the times, and they have a consensus on what constitutes sophistication. Thinking in Culture I believe one of the greatest advantages of the modern world is providing unprecedented opportunities for ordinary people. If you can offer a product or service better than others, you will stand out, and no one cares who your father is. Of course, society is not entirely fair, but the inequality is not primarily reflected in hard conditions like money. It manifests in the differences in the thinking levels and cultural habits of people from different social strata. A large-scale study published in the journal Nature in 2022 suggests that cross-class friendships are a good way to lift impoverished children out of poverty. If a poor child can attend a school with many affluent children, even if their own family remains impoverished, the probability of escaping poverty increases significantly. Why? Because they will make friends with affluent kids, and cross-class friendships enhance their insights, enabling them to make better decisions. As we've mentioned before, one of the best things parents can do for their children is to move to a better community, providing them with good role models. If you strip away all the wealth, status, and professional knowledge from people like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and Mark Zuckerberg, and make them ordinary young people in contemporary China, as long as their spirit is intact, they would quickly learn essential skills, overcome crucial obstacles, rise from the bottom, and still change the world. Moreover, they would inspire a large number of people around them. All time travel novels explore this thought experiment. Furthermore, knowledge is now freely available, tools are ready-made, and the path is clear. Then, why don't others succeed? Ordinary people are limited by their self-imposed, rather than socially imposed, constraints, burying their talents in the mediocrity of daily life. As we've mentioned before, mediocrity is like gravity, a force that automatically and naturally pulls you down. Parrish's book discusses how to escape the gravitational pull of mediocrity. In this video, let's first explore why most people are mediocre. There's a popular saying, choice is greater than effort, suggesting that the key to a successful life is navigating a few critical junctures. Getting into which university, working for which company, completing the most important project, marrying whom, etc. Parrish disagrees. He argues that ordinary moments, those instances where we may not even realize we are making choices, often have a more significant impact on our success than major decisions. For example, during a routine meeting, while presenting your team's project, a colleague from another group, Tony, raises a question and seems to belittle you in his words. You immediately counterattack, using even more harsh language than him. This leads to Result 1 The meeting not achieving its purpose, requiring another one to be scheduled. Result 2 The progress toward your goals significantly falling behind. Result 3 Post-meeting, you have to individually talk to leaders and colleagues to clarify the facts. Result 4 Your relationship with Tony, including the relationship between your two groups, is damaged, and repairing it will take time. Result 5 This conflict weakens trust in you throughout the company. All this turmoil resulted from a simple argument. If you could press a pause button and choose not to quarrel with that colleague, prioritizing the bigger picture, you probably would. But life is not a game. Parrish's insight is that mediocrity is achieved in each of these small incidents. 
Unknowingly, you repeatedly, automatically fall into that situation. Over time, when you look up, you realize you are out of the game, without even the chance to participate in significant decisions. Let's review the scenario. It was a regular meeting. You were reporting on work as usual. Tony raised a question, which was normal, and your report did have some issues. Moreover, he usually speaks this way, so logically, you shouldn't be bothered. Why did it bother you this time? Was it because you skipped breakfast in the morning? Was it because you had an argument with your wife yesterday? Was it because the air conditioning in the meeting room was too hot due to a malfunction? Was it because Tony's recent performance was good, and you felt threatened? You can't explain it yourself. If, at that moment, you could press the pause button, take a moment to think, and then respond, it would have been better. We've quoted Viktor Frankl, a psychologist famous for his quote that was popularized in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. What about your power and freedom? The theme of Parrish's book is how to find that freedom and capability. The principle is something you've known for a long time. Avoid being hijacked by emotions and falling into automatic reactions. Use mindfulness, step out of yourself, employ metacognition, and engage in clear thinking, that's the origin of the book's title. Thus, clear thinking is not about scientific methods or logical thinking. It's a mindset, a training to overcome automatic reactions. Clear thinking itself is not difficult. Know the goal, eliminate irrelevant factors, and make the best decision. The challenge lies in pausing automatic reactions and entering clear thinking. Since most people are in automatic mode most of the time, they end up being mediocre. If you can frequently step out of automatic mode and enter clear thinking, you will turn ordinary moments into extraordinary results. While others expend much effort correcting mistakes and troubles caused by automatic reactions, you head straight for your goal. Over time, this accumulation makes you remarkable. Clear thinking challenges instinct. Why do we automatically react? Because it's the result of evolution. Throughout human history, these reactions were the optimal choices, the guarantee for our survival and reproduction. So, we automated and accelerated them, turning them into default settings, without the need for deliberation. Imagine being challenged on the African savanna. If you don't counterattack, your social status will drop. However, in today's complex society, where everyone has multiple identities, many situations don't follow the rules of the African savanna. We must deliberate in many instances. To step out of instinct, we must respect instinct, and to do that, we must recognize instinct. Parrish lists four of the most prominent and dangerous default settings. The first is, the emotion default. You are reacting to an emotion, not to reason and facts. You argue because you are angry, not because arguing benefits you. Some people are inherently impulsive, exploding in any situation. But many times, we are influenced by environmental and physical factors. Lack of sleep, hunger, fatigue, distraction, being in a hurry doing something else, or being in an unfamiliar place. All these can be considered as some kind of emotion, and you are reacting passively. The second is, the ego default. Because you instinctively care about your status and rank in the group, if you feel someone is challenging your position, you immediately counterattack. Perhaps you got angry with Tony because Tony posed a threat to you. You may not want to admit it, and even in self-reflection afterward, you might not think of it, but you have this instinct. I think ego can also be considered a type of emotional default, but Parrish indeed deserves to list it separately because it's too common. Ego makes you always want to prove yourself, always afraid of being falsified. This greatly delays progress. Parrish has a great quote. Our desire to appear successful often overpowers being objectively right. The third is, the social default. You always want to do the same as others because you are afraid of being an outsider. If everyone applauds, you will applaud too. If everyone obeys, you will obey. You know the saying, a wise no is louder than a thousand yes, 
but doing something different involves risks. Actually, until recently, consistency was considered a virtue. Parrish gives an example. Suppose you are digging soil together with a group of people, working together energetically with your hands. As you work, an idea comes to your mind. Can I invent a shovel to dig the soil more efficiently? If you take a week off to experiment with a shovel, the team's progress will fall behind. What if you don't succeed in making a shovel, and everyone blames you for being lazy? Can you handle that? Breaking the social default requires a thick-skinned attitude. Buffett has a great quote in one of his shareholder letters. As a group, lemmings may have a rotten image, but no individual lemming has ever received bad press. The fourth instinct is, the inertia default. You continue to do what you are accustomed to, resisting change. Everyone loves to talk about innovation, but most are just paying lip service. New ideas, new processes, and new environments make people uncomfortable, and there's always the risk of failure. Maintaining the status quo requires no effort, while attempting new things, if they fail, brings a particularly strong psychological impact. So, most people just go with the flow. Maybe you clearly know that this marriage partner is not a good match, but step by step, following the process, seeing everyone getting married, you get married too. Maybe everyone in the company thinks the current direction is wrong, but since the system is like this, no one wants to initiate change. These four default settings are the significant reasons why most people fall into mediocrity. You are just an automatic running machine, you don't exercise free will. Of course, the question of whether free will really exists is also a problem. In Robert M. Sapolsky's book, Behave, Sapolsky argues that humans don't have free will. We are ultimately just machines. In Determined, Sapolsky specifically discusses why humans don't have free will. If you're interested, you can check out our interpretation. Parrish here also doesn't advocate using willpower to overcome instinctive reactions. Willpower is unreliable. What you need is not to cancel default behavior but to make the behavior you want to adopt the default. We'll discuss this further in the next lecture. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.